Good morning to you and welcome to this service coming from the congregation of Mark Evangelist, the Uniting Church here in North Melbourne. A special welcome to those who are not normally part of our worshipping community, but are joining us either via, via the live stream or the recorded version of this story of this service. From the God who is and who was and who is to come, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, grace and peace be with you all. Thank you, Donald. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Father Almighty, wisdom through and over all creation. We glorify and adore you. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus Christ, loving Savior of the world. We glorify and adore you. 
Blessed are you, eternal spirit, gracious source of light and life. We glorify and adore you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord God of endless power and might, of boundless love and care, we praise your name and we pray. Come among us this day and illumine our darkness. Come and revive us from death. Come and heal our wounds. Come and burn up the thorns of our sin. Come, Lord and God, with your gentle loving kindness and pour upon us your fullest benediction that we may lift our hearts and voices in joyful praise. Amen. Over the last few months now, we've been slowly working through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And we come now right to find ourselves right in the middle of the second half. Rob drew, drew our attention a couple of weeks ago to the prevalence of words like then and therefore, which draw some conclusion from the doxology, from the account of God's saving work in the first part of the letter. Today, we're in the thick of it. And our focus is going to be around questions of moral motivation and the consequence of moral action. Paul speaks about that. And in the gospel reading chosen from today's set reading for the gospel from Mark, we hear Jesus also speaking about the source of good and evil in us. As we listen for God's word, then let us listen for the do's and the don'ts. And also for Paul's concluding words about forgiveness and reconciliation. May God silence in us any voice but his own, that we may be ready to hear and respond with faith to the wisdom of God read and proclaimed. Amen. Thank you, Neil. A reading from Ephesians. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. So then, putting away falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbours, for we are members of one another. <clears throat> Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labour and work honestly with their hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And to do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus a market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, 
but eat with defiled hands. He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honours me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A passing amusement in the schoolyard when I was a kid was to sidle up to someone else, usually a friend, give him a good hard punch in the arm, and then step back in feigned horror to declare, I'm so sorry, the devil made me do it. Now, the principal purpose of the game was not, of course, to demonstrate some profound truth about the motivations of human action, but the chase which ensued, in which the puncher tried to avoid what the devil would cause the punchee to do in retribution. Of course, of course, modern sophisticates are beyond believing that there even exists a devil, let alone that such an entity could motivate us to act. And that's part of the joke, of course, in the schoolyard. But that unbelief has far reaching consequences. If what I do wrong cannot be attributed to a higher power, then I become solely responsible for the evil that I do. That, of course, is also part of the schoolyard joke and why my friend chases me rather than rails against the devices of the devil. That might not yet seem to be a problem. Yet without the devil, not only what wrong, but also what right we do comes to be centred on us as individuals. I and I alone are responsible for what good I do and for what evil I do. Now, this is assumed by the simple moral systems which operate in and through and around us most of the time. The assumption that we are free moral agents and what good or bad we do is our own work. And that mostly works in day-to-day -day life. So far, so good. However, how do I know in the first place what is good and what is wrong? There are two basic options here. The first is the simplest, but also the most terrifying, and so the less palatable and stable. Something is good because I do it, or bad because I do it. In this I am myself, the definition of goodness and badness. This is the argument of those whose actions can only be described as sociopathic whether those actions are good or bad by other measures. And it's not only the diagnosed sociopath who thinks and acts in this way. The second source for goodness and madness is most generally characterized as being somehow outside of me. Moral measure is located in society or culture, in the family or the tribe. This is, in fact, our usual operating assumption when it comes to sourcing moral truth. It's on the basis of morality as communal that most people more or less adhere to the current lockdown directives and are horrified that a few loud and angry voices are heard in the streets in protest against this particular corporate definition of the good. Yet this moral reference point is also unstable. Because we know as well 
The truth is sometimes on the lips of the contrary voice in the streets and not in the churches or the halls of power. Of this, the old prophets are the proof with Jesus himself. That tension between individualized and communalized moral authority cuts right through us. And it's impossible to relax it other than fleetingly. History as a whole is driven by the struggle between the one and the many, the familiar and the novel, the choice of the individual and the need of the many. Now, all of this is just preamble to hearing something in our text today to which we now come. There is in and around what we've heard this morning from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, a lot of do this and don't do that, a lot of moral direction. And for the most part, we would agree that it's correct. So do what Paul says and don't do what he criticizes. The moral life is hardly rocket science. It's not rocket science, but it is boring. Morality is boring. It's necessary. And once more, do what Paul says and don't do what he criticizes. And read it again later on for yourselves. Morality is essential, but it's also dull. Not in the sense that it's uneventful either. History is the struggle over moral vision, over what human beings should do and become, and often becomes a matter of life and death. Morality is boring in the sense that the kind of dynamics between the individual's needs and the needs of the community, these things are always there. There is always a decision to make, a balance to strike, a wager to make with respect to the next crisis, literally the next moment of judgment, whether ours or God's. Morality is boring because it's mundane. It is there all the time. It's what comes with living together in the world. And yet for all of the morality we hear in this morning's texts, Paul is not being boring. We're paying close attention. He makes his moral declarations and then it's almost too familiar for us to us to notice it, but then strangely undermines what he said with the word, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The strangeness here is that forgiveness is not a moral action in the way that other exhortations to action might be. Do this, don't do that. Properly, forgiveness sets aside all rulemaking for the sake of something other than the rules. There is implied here a kind of amorality, even immorality. There is something to be forgiven. The laws have been broken. But forgiveness sets the mundane aside, devaluing the moral expectation, which has not been met. Our struggles over morality typically, boringly, end in alienation or annihilation. Bombs in Kabul airport this week are one instance of this. But so too is this or that lesser or more lesser or more important local moral outrage in the news feeds, or maybe what happened at home this week. But forgiveness neither alienates nor annihilates. Instead, forgiveness creates where otherwise would have been only the nothingness of moral failure. And the appearance of something where there was nothing is never boring. The problem with morality is not that this or that thing we might or mightn't like is encouraged or, forget or forbidden. The problem with morality is it's normally equated with godliness, which is why ministers preparing funerals sometimes have to endure the declaration that while the deceased was a committed agnostic, she was nevertheless a very good Christian woman. 
It is, of course, not much better in the church, where we're strongly tempted to turn forgiveness into another moral action. One more good thing we do by which we distinguish ourselves further from those others who don't do the right thing. But godliness in the gospel is not a matter of doing good things, not the doing of good things, rather. It's a making good of things. Doing good things puts them in order. It's the grammar of day-to-day -day life together by which we make sense to each other. Morals are standing orders with permission already granted. But making good, in contrast, asks no permission. It simply creates new things where there was no hope of anything. It raises the dead. It breathes spirit into dust. This creativity is what it is to forgive. And that's why forgiveness is the hardest thing we can do, but also the one thing needful. Maybe the devil does make us do stuff, maybe not. But God makes us, forgives us into being in order that we might do what God does. We are that others might come to be. So hear St. Paul once more. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Forgive, create. Thank you, Donald. together in a prayer of confession, at the end of which I invite you to join together in the responses, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, after you hear me.
announce those lines. Let us pray. We bless you, O God, for you have created and sustained us and all things for your own name's sake, that we might glorify and enjoy you forever. Yet we confess that in thought, word, and deed, we fail to bring you glory. Forgive us when we establish ourselves as the source of moral truth, whether to absolve ourselves or condemn ourselves. Forgive us too when we acquiesce to the patterns and expectations of family, city, church, or culture, whether because it is simply more convenient or for fear of living more truthfully. Forgive us then when we find ample justification for theft or dishonest work, for bitterness or malice, for avarice, adultery, deceit, or misplaced pride. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Reconciling God with you, there is mercy, forgiveness, and fullness of redemption. In Christ Jesus, you saved us from the deeds of death and opened for us the hidden ways of your love. Give us then what we need to walk in those ways. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The apostle declares that if anyone sins, we have in Christ Jesus the righteous atonement for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Hear then Christ's word of grace to us. Your sin are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We join together in a confession of the word in the form of the words of the Apostles Creed, which tells the way of forgiveness in creation. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Just a couple of notices before we come to the time of prayer for ourselves, for this world, and for God's church. Our study groups continue in the week to come. Uh, this is a series of studies which you are welcome to join at any time. This coming week, we're looking at the book of James. And if you've not been part of the group who would like to be, please get in contact with me and I'll direct you to the material. We are, of course, waiting to see what's going to happen this week so far as the lockdowns go. I don't suppose it's looking very um, positive in terms of the likelihood of our being back together in this building um, very soon. But uh, we are keeping on hold things like a baptism and the commissioning of elders and discussions about congregational future and worship. And we'll let you know as soon as possible when we think these things might take place. Thank you, Rosemary. Let us bring our concerns for the church, the world and ourselves before God in prayer. When you hear my words, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with the refrain, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the world. Loving and merciful God, we pray for all people afflicted and ravaged by conflicts and violence in and near Afghanistan. 
May our world leaders be strengthened in wisdom, a commitment to peace, and united in pursuing swift, effective, diplomatic, and where necessary, military goals and actions. We thank you for the brave and tireless efforts by so many persons assisting others in the midst of the turmoil, danger, and illness and pray for the safety and rescue of those who have not been able to leave Kabul and indeed for all refugees throughout the world. We thank you also for those throughout the world who are carrying the mission of peace between Christians and Muslims, their ongoing search for democracy and their commitment to alleviating the disasters from climate change. May they reach the needy the homeless, the sick in body, mind and spirit, the lonely and the frightened. May both the helpers and the helped feel your mercy, grace and peace. Living God, we pray especially for all who are struggling in the grips of COVID-19. We thank you for those who are in the front line of fighting this menacing and invasive virus. We pray for your guidance for our medical, scientific and political leaders. May they collaborate with mercy and compassion across all ethnic, religious and geographic divisions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church here and throughout the world. We thank you for all Christian leaders and people who strive in unity to carry forward Christ's ministry and mission, and for all who strive to live, live faithful lives and for those who are persecuted for their faith. Thank you for all who work for Hotha Mission, for Craig, for Donald, for Rod, for Church Council, for our Finance and Property Committee, and for all those who contribute to the ongoing life and management of Mark the Evangelist, quietly and humbly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray for ourselves. Ever present God, we pray for patience as we await the time when we can meet in person and follow through with our planned meetings and with the baptism of Manat. We bring to you in our prayers, Norma and Rob and the Gallagher family, the Duckworth family, Suzanne, and others whom we now name in silence. Help our small church and congregation and Hotham mission to do your will to be a community of peacemakers and bridge builders and to ever find ways to speak and act with calm humility. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the teachings of Paul. As the lockdowns continue, we are aware of anger and uncertainty and fear around us. Forgive us when our words have been less than truthful, when our actions have lacked integrity, when our words have been thoughtless or offhand. Guard our hearts from duplicity and our lips from anger. Teach us to speak in ways that bring your blessing, peace and justice to those with whom we speak or converse. We seek grace not to condemn or criticize, but first to find, find common ground and grasp the things that draw us all together, not concentrate on what holds us apart. Help us to take the richness of another's thought and hold it precious as our own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all power and might, author and giver of all good things, plant in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true faith, nourish us with goodness, 
bring out in us the fruits of work towards peace and justice. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with us, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, go then into the world with St. Paul in your ears. Put away from yourselves bitterness and wrath and anger, wrangling and slander, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. In this way, be imitators of God, co-creators as God's beloved children. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. <laughs>